So I'm an architect. I'm not going to show any architecture today. Instead, I'm going to talk about these drawings that I make. Now, I call them drawings. They're drawings because they're made out of lines and only lines. And that's one of the things in which one can use to demarcate a drawing. But they're actually not drawings in the way that we usually think about the line marking the ground. They're actually much closer in many ways to paintings. They're much closer to the accumulation of marks that are differentiated through color. So here they are somewhere between drawings and somewhere between paintings. Now why this is an interesting thing to talk about and why an architect is going to talk about drawing and painting instead of buildings is that this is actually the tectonics that underlie all of our digital modeling software. All of our digital modeling software are being operated through the calculations of tangencies and normals. And actually, if we can begin to explore that aesthetically, we can think a little bit differently about the software that we're using to design. So I'm going to need to talk a little bit about painting and painting and drawing. So on your right, or on my right, we have Bronzino. On, your, on my left, we have Rembrandt. And what I want to say here is that in the traditions of drawing, a line demarcates a figure on a ground. It says, you're in, you're out. Here's the start of something, maybe a leg. Here's the background, which is going to disappear into the whiteness of the page. Painting's very different. Painting's actually marks on a matrix. So you have the whole field of the canvas, the whole field of the matrix that the paint has to emerge from. So if painting is a mark in a matrix and drawing is a line on a ground, uh, how do we move between these two things? Because one of the things that we can talk about is that our software is operating through lines, through vectors, but what we're judging is actually pixels, marks in a matrix. So we're doing one thing, but looking at something else. When we started to think about artists that did this, that were working within the mark and the matrix, Seurat comes to mind. Because one of the things that Seurat was very conscious of was not uh, painting, let's say, the geometric composition from a studio or painting even from life, but what he was painting was the optical vibrations that would happen when different marks of color entered next to each other. And from that, how could you build an edge? How could you begin to build depth? How could you make something shimmer? Now, if Seurat is a pretty powerful artist, the British op artist, Bridget Riley, is uh, another kind of major figure of the 20th century. And you've got you to gotta think, all right, that's a little weird if you're going to start your career copying Seurat. I mean, you want to find something difficult to copy. Pointillism is a pretty insane thing to try to copy. You're not going to draw a figure in its outlines and its boundaries. You're going to be copying dot by dot by dot by dot. And when she does this, what she's learning, actually, is how to begin to work through the kind of optical vibrations that those color marks make. So when she does her art, which is not colored initially, it's black and white, uh, you may ask, well, what's the relation there with Surat? But what she's studying and what she learned from that and what she's able to produce with this are that shimmering dynamic of the optical movements. Because this thing's moving. If you got eyeballs, this thing's moving. That's uh, one of the things that OpArt does, is it comes in and it actually glitches your eyeballs. It makes you aware that you're not fully consciously in control of your sensorial systems. It's actually affecting you, diffracting, uh, the cones and rods within your eyes, and in a way, estranging you from your own uh, sensorial system. And in that begins an aesthetic effect. I often also think, you know, it'd be if we locked the door, we'd see how long we'd last with one of these paintings up there, because it gets a little intense at times. It gets a little uh, disturbing to watch it move. But that history that she was dealing with there, with the, the optics from Surat, also is very directly related to the very first computational aesthetic experiments, the New Tendency Group in Northern Italy, the Bit International out of Zagreb, and in the 1960s, when these guys are first exploring a computational aesthetic, the thing they're trying to do is op art. They're looking at the moray patterns, they're looking at the glitches, they're looking at the ways in which perceptual systems relate to computational code, and how you could begin to work between those two, combine them, begin to develop a new art form, an art form now that one is generating through computers. And if you really wanted to step back even further, they're not the first people to identify morays. Morays as diffraction patterns, morays as glitches within the combinations of lines overlapping lines, 
goes all the way back through treaties of engraving and etching. And one of the things that you would do this to do, you would do this to create clouds, things without boundaries, things without edges. And if you think back to those examples of painting, if a line is demarcating a figure on a ground, the painting is challenging the relationship between figure and ground. The painting is starting to drive things into the ground, drive things out of the ground, what emerges from the field of the matrix. So these are the things that we started to explore when we did our own drawings. Now, again, I say they're drawings because there's lines and there's only lines, but we're really thinking about them as paintings. And the effects that we can produce as one starts to try to compose with moray effects. So how do you get something that at the top stutters, jitters, starts to look like it's uh, uh, unsure of where to go? But with the same method, then we get this furriness over here, so that all of a sudden you're moving from something very mechanical to something very biological. How would you go from fur to stutter all within one system of drawing? Now I want to explain this a little bit too. Here's the tectonic part. This is how our curvature is drawn in every single one of our modeling softwares that we use as architects today. It's drawn through tangents and normals that are no longer rendered, that are operating within the computational background, and all you see is the curve. So each of those lines tangent moving along the curve, that's how it's being computed. And each of the lines normal or perpendicular to the curve, that's how it's being measured. And so a field of curves begins to become a surface, and it begins to become the kind of background tectonic, the uh, construction system, the assembly of how one builds up uh, drawing within a digital software. So this is what we're doing. These drawings are made out of straight lines and straight lines only. The curves are turned off. The tangents and normals are turned on. Those are the only two pieces of information that we're using to build these drawings. Yet. Uh, we don't think of them in that sort of, uh, let's explain the system behind what we're doing. We're looking at the optical effects. We're treating them aesthetically like paintings. How do you begin to drive depth? How do you make something shimmer and move? How do you begin to lose and gain an edge between a ground and a figure? All of those things are there built into these drawings. Now, there's only straight lines, but there's tens of thousands of straight lines. And as they begin to overlap, as the colors begin to mix, as the different diffractions begin to build, all of these other effects for the drawings begin to come alive. And so again, the moray patterns, how one begins to get that movement and change and shimmer and uh, qualities of almost a material, where something that is just pixels begins to have qualities of rain, of fur, of um, metallicness, and what you can do then as an architect once you're beginning to explore this level of your mediation. Because again, as architects, we don't build buildings. We make drawings and models for buildings. And so we got to be as aware as we can of our mediations. We have to be as aware as we can of the systems through which we create our representations. And we have to exploit them. Exploit them not just for concepts, but for the aesthetics that they can produce as well. Uh, a couple years ago, we started doing drawings that were focused around ideas of symmetry. And you may think, why now? Why start to do symmetry? It's a little classical. It's a little old school. But what we wanted to do is we didn't want the drawings to appear to have a narrative moving across the page. We wanted them to stop. And when they stopped, wiggle. So just enough wiggle, just enough to begin to animate it so that you would see it lock and then start to move back and forth with the qualities of depth. Now I say it's symmetrical, but if you really look at it, it's not symmetrical. There's nothing on the left or the right or the top or the bottom that's identical in terms of its symmetry. And in fact, that in and of itself becomes a kind of aesthetic driver, because it forces you to continually look back and forth and top and bottom, back and forth, and each time questioning, where is the logic? How is that matching to that? And each time being slightly frustrated by what you find on the other side not matching where you were, and in that elongating one's aesthetic experience of the drawing. There was also a series when we started to work now with uh, almost qualities of luminosity, how things could glow but glow from behind. There was drawings that then built up something that would emerge as a figure right down the middle. And again, these are uh, maybe a little bit more subtle, but they're working on exactly the same principles of how you would begin to make a drawing shimmer, 
how you would begin to uh, explore those qualities of depth, how you could move in between painting and drawing. And that's really what these mediations are after for us. That's really what we're trying to uh, collide, if we use some of the phrases that started our day, is how you bring together the logic of one system and the aesthetics of another, and in the tension between the two, allow those mediums to bash each other. We are now, as a discipline architects, in a uh, field of medium bashing, because we're no longer purely building the models or the drawings that we were traditionally tied to, but instead somewhere within this soup of computation and the ways in which we can begin to explore it, the ways in which we can begin to provoke ideas from it, the ways in which we can begin to provoke aesthetic experiences from it is something of uh, intense value today for young architects and for the discipline at large. And this last drawing that I'm gonna leave you with, uh, one of the things we were trying to do with it is we were trying to make it too bright. How do you make something too bright? something that almost burns a little bit into your retina. And then within that, the moray patterns that would drift and soup and sink and pull back across the field, and in that experience begin to elongate one's aesthetic attention and hopefully begin to derive other ideas about what it is that one does when one draws within a digital medium. Thank you. <laughs>